to it because you couldn't tell. I didn't know it could sing. Hello, good evening, y'all. I just wanted to give uh, just a quick update about our silent auction dinner on February 5th. This is Sunday, 6 to 8 p.m. There's two things you can do with that. The first is to get a ticket. They're $30 a piece. You go to the front office, and Lee will put your name on the list, and you can pick either pork or salmon. Now, if you have an item that you want to donate, you can also drop it off at the front office lobby area and I will come and collect it. And that's all you need to do. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the youth ministry and we're looking forward to having a great turnout for that dinner. So come on out. Thanks.
Thank you very much for coming this evening. And thanks once again to the staff at First Pres that said something on the Holocaust. Uh, isn't that an uplifting, exciting, enervating topic? And I said, no, it's not, but it's necessary. It's necessary for us to be talking about this, not only to come to understand what happened and why it happened, but also to be sensitized to it in terms of some of the ways we can treat people today. How do we regard other people, and as a consequence, maybe that was an act of God. <laughs> I should probably tell you, today's session at noon, we started pretty promptly at noon at Montague's restaurant, and I thought, well, we're going to stop about one, so I call a, a timeout. As a former coach, I can do that. I call a timeout. And people said, well, we have more questions, and we want to stay. So at about 2.30, I was leaving Montague's. So I want to thank those people for that. At noon, we talked today about heroes of the Holocaust. So if you missed that, I think it was a fairly uplifting session. I'll be presumptuous and say that. There were persons who risked their lives to help rescue Jews, and we talked about them. I know that Tamara has videotaped that, and I guess that's going to be available on the church website at some point. So if you weren't there, you can still pick that particular topic up. So that was an uplifting topic. Now we're going to talk about hatred. So from heroes to hatred, I want to talk a bit about anti-Semitism, and I'll lay my card on the table right away so you're not surprised. Adolf Hitler did not invent anti-Semitism. It did not originate with him. It was a historical phenomenon that he tapped in order to further his diabolical purposes. So tonight I want to look at that. And as a Christian, I'll also lay this card on the table, it's going to be a little bit difficult for me at times because unfortunately we Christians who are commanded by Jesus to love God and love one another, sometimes our tradition and sometimes people within it have actually propagated anti-Semitism. And I hope to be able to say something about that this evening so you'll understand why that was the case and how it was the case. And we can be sensitized to it in the year 2023. So with that long, long, long introduction, let's get started. A few definitions. What in the world is prejudice? Well, prejudice is making negative judgments about somebody else, individual, a group, because of their race, their class in society, their ethnicity, their age, their disability, their obesity, their religion, their sexual orientation, and other personal characteristics, all without even knowing those people. Get that? Making judgments without even knowing those people. So that's prejudice. Now what is racism? Well, racism is that prejudice or discrimination against people of a certain race. It often includes the idea that certain races are superior to others, so that means that the other races are inferior. And by way of illustration, one of the things that Adolf Hitler did, he regarded Jews as being the members of a separate race. And then he said that these Jews were not worth anything, and so he basically engaged in racism, but against a group of people who are not members of a certain race. Jews can be black. There are black African Jews. Jews can be Chinese. They can be Asian, as well as being Caucasian. Those are the three major races on the planet, so to say the anthropologists, right? So Hitler set something up to be able to say Jews are one race, and the superior race would be us Aryans with blonde hair and blue eyes and being athletically fit. P.S. Hitler was none of those things. 
Jones. He didn't have blonde hair, didn't have blue eyes, he had spindly little legs, and he had a chest that caved in, he suffered from Parkinson's disease. He was not your ideal exemplar of this mythological Aryan race that he probably Scapegoating. I'm familiar with this as a college professor. I know that some of my colleagues in this room are college professors. And students will say, you know, I did poorly on the exam, but it's the professor's fault. He didn't make it, or she didn't make the information clear. <laughs> or the exam really covered things we didn't go over in class. Or, you yep. know, it's really not my fault. Um, yep. not, not that Andrew would ever have said such a thing about the faculty <laughs> Lander, but again, it makes somebody or some group responsible for your problems. Hitler does that par excellence because what he's doing is saying all of our problems have as their source the Jews. If you get rid of the Jews, you get rid of the problem. You see the logic of that? It's fallacious, but it's still logical, right? We have problems, Jews cause them. Get rid of the Jews, we get rid of the problems. Let's start. And stereotypes. Stereotypes are a kind of oversimplified belief or generalization and attitude toward a person or group without respect to individual differences. Now, stereotypes can be positive or they can be negative. A positive stereotype is all blacks are great athletes. I remember as a coach having to face Wilberforce University, a black university in Ohio. All the players were black. Half of my players were black and half were white. And I had to assure them that not every person on that opposite team was Michael Jordan wearing a Wilberforce University jersey. So a stereotype can be positive or it, it, it can be negative, like all blondes are dumb. <laughs> you better be careful. The woman I'm dating is blonde and she's sitting right over there and she's looking at you with evil eyes. I just want to, I just want to tip you off, okay? Well, let's look at some of the stereotypes, and some uh, prejudices, the kinds of ways of demoting, denigrating, looking down on people. And if you look all the way back to uh, William Shakespeare and his play, The Merchant of Venice, uh, Shylock, here portrayed by Orson Welles. Isn't that interesting? Orson Welles from 1969. Shylock's a Jewish money lender who charges exorbitant rates of interest on his loans to really poor people. What a jerk. And the conclusion becomes, what a Jew. Got it? What a jerk. What a Jew. All Jews do this. Or Alec Guinness's portrayal of Fagin in 1948 from, yeah, Charles Dickens's novel, Oliver Twist. Fagin symbolizes in that film the persistence of evil and of greed. He teaches boys how to become pickpockets, and then he uh, pressures Oliver, of course the star of the novel Oliver Twist, to become deeply involved in this life of crime. So obviously what's the message? Well, you generalize and say being around Jews means you simply are embroiled in things that are negative in the society. Raoul Hilberg is a very, very, very famous Jewish Holocaust scholar. And he makes the point that the Nazis did not discard the past. They built it. They did not begin a development. They completed it. That's his way of saying what I said to you at the beginning of my presentation, and that is Hitler did not invent anti-Semitism. He simply capitalized on it. He tapped it and he used it for his purposes. There was one particular message that came out, and it came out in a newspaper that I'll mention later in my presentation, and it basically said, the Jews are our nightmare. The Jews are the cause of all of our problems. Anti-Judaism is a little bit distinguished from anti-Semitism, Anti-Semitism is really the hatred of Jews. Anti-Judaism can be an opposition to Judaism as a religion. And so Holocaust scholars, to be honest with you, make 
a distinction and are engaged in a great debate as to whether the Christian church was anti-Semitic or whether it was just simply anti-Jewish. That is, you know that Christianity began as a sect within the mother religion, Judaism. We share the same sacred scriptures with Jews. We share the same monotheism. We share basically the same set of ethics, but we had one big difference. And that is, we believe that Jesus was the Mashiach in Hebrew, the Messiah, Christos in Greek, the Christ. And Jews did not believe that was the case. So that caused hostility between the two. And by the end of the first century, when, when Christianity and Judaism separate now as two separate religions, pr prior to that, Christianity was a sect within Judaism. So by 100 AD, the two religions split, and there's a lot of antagonism then, because they are competing with each other for converts. So some scholars argue this is kind of Christians anti-Jewish, right? Not Christians hating Jews. That's a little bit clean, it's a little bit simple. I think there are moments in Christian history where Christians actually hated Jews and were anti-Semitic. You can see whether you agree with me later or not. That would be my take, and I'll say more about that later. This is really a bunch of information on this page. And you've got to have better eyesight than I do to be seeing that from way at the back there. But the themes are, and I put in here the particular Christian theologians and church leaders that said them, as well as scripture texts to which they appealed to justify their charge. I, I won't go through all of those because it's just too complicated. But the first one is Jews are, reje are, re are rejected people. Uh, they're no longer in a special relationship with God. They refuse to accept Jesus, so the heck with them, right? They're off the stage as God's chosen people. And now the church and we Christians are God's chosen people. Number two, Jews are a deicide people. That is, the Jews killed Jesus. Therefore, on Good Friday, when we remember Jesus' crucifixion and we burst forth from the churches in medieval Europe, you Jews better be hiding. And the historical accounts indicate they did. Because at that point, Christians were willing to say, it's payback time. You killed Jesus. Now we're going to get you. Number three, Jews are a blind evil. I'll show you a slide of this in just a second. Where Jews look at the sacred scriptures which we Christians use to make claims about Jesus, that he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, he's the suffering servant, he's whatever. And the charge is that Jews, Jews don't see it because they're blind. They're just blind. They, they, they don't see it because they can't see it, they're blind. The fourth one, Jews are a people who cannot be saved. Nothing they can do can gain them favor in God's eyes. Number five, Jews are demonic people. Gee, they're, they're, they're not just disagreeing with this. They're not just kind of bad. They're actually devils. They have been demonized. And sometimes in, in art of the Middle Ages, you'll see Jews with horns. You'll see Jews with a spiked tail and a pitchfork. Again, a denigration of Jews as being either the devil himself or agents of the devil himself. Number six, Jews are a people without rights. That is, a synagogue can be destroyed because what happens in a synagogue? Disbelief. Impiety. Insanity. Damned by God. Synagogues are damned by God from this particular theological orientation. Number seven, Jews are a wandering people. Why are they wandering? Not W-O-N-D-E-R, not inquisitive, but wandering, W-A-N-D-E-R. It's because God is punishing them for not accepting Jesus, so there are people that always seem to be on the move. That'll be a very interesting kind of notion later, because Hitler's going to argue 
that rats also migrate, and they migrate in packs. Everybody wants a society rid of rats. Therefore, if we rid the German society and the world society of Jews, we're getting rid of rats. And who would not want to get rid of rats? They travel in packs, just like Jews. Number eight, Jews are suited only for slaughter. And one of my favorite theologians from the early church, St. John Chrysostom, argued that Jews in Judaism are dogs, wild animals, and they're suited only for slaughter, suited only for killing. So those are some anti-Jewish teachings by Christian leaders. And some Holocaust scholars that they indicated would say that's anti-Jewish. Sometimes it feels awfully dangerously like it's anti-Semitic to my eyes and to my ears, but you can make that judgment for yourselves. I mentioned before the notion of Judaism being blind, and these are a couple of slides that I took of the cathedral in Strasbourg, France, built in the uh, 14th century, I think the 14th century, if I remember correctly, and look at the left. The left is the church. You can see the triumphant cross of Christ in both of the figures on the left in both slides. But look on the right. Can you see the Jewish representation being covered with a blindfold? And in her left hand, on the one on the left, the slide on the left, what she's holding there is the Torah. That is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, which are the first, the same five books in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and do, 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 do. Several charges against Jews were leveled by the Christian church. One of them was called blood libel, ritual murder. Now, if you can look closely here, this is gruesome, I apologize for it. In fact, I told people today at noon, because a couple persons said to me, you're not showing us any pictures of what people looked like when the camps were liberated. And that's absolutely true. Because my sensitivities can't take it, to be honest with you. It'll make me cry in front of you because these people were so badly maimed and starved and beaten. You can see those on the internet if you would like. They documented all of the liberation of the camps beginning first with the how and going to all the others. And it, it's really painful to see. So this is kind of a painful one, but I don't know how else to illustrate it to you than by showing it to you from a document. And if you look at the center, you'll see a young Christian boy who's been kidnapped by all those Jews. And then he has been ritually killed so that his blood can be used as a substance to bind together the elements of matzah bread for the Passover Seder, that is Pesach, the Passover meal in the spring. That sounds awfully weird to all of us, right? But that was a, a widespread myth during the majority of the Middle Ages. Christian children were kidnapped, ritually killed, and their blood was used to make matzah bread for the Passover. I think I said it one of our previous sessions, and my gosh, we have nine sessions available to you all, all together. One of the reasons why in the Jewish tradition when the Passover meal is celebrated today, 2023, it will happen in the spring, why the door is left open, the door is left open at every Jewish celebration of the Pesach or the Passover meal for two reasons. A, the prophet Elijah may come, and that will signal the advent of the Messiah coming to earth. And secondly, it's to say, we have no secrets here. And if you want to come in and look, you'll see that we aren't ritually murdering any kidnapped Christian children. Isn't that interesting that even though you and I would find this charge repulsive, at least I, I, I hope all of us would find this repulsive, Jews are still sensitive to it today. The Sturmer, 
That is, the attacker, the stormer, that's how you translate that, I suppose, into English. My, my German is not as good as my, as my friend Ashley back there. He may correct me on this. But that was a very popular weekly magazine in Germany that had incredible publicity and incredible subscription from 1922 to 1945, and you can see the same kind of thing being shown here. Look how the Jews, the two Jews, are being betrayed in the right-hand portion of the slide, and you can see the children that have been kidnapped, and blood is coming out being collected in this particular bowl. So, the Sturmer, this is not the Middle Ages, this is the 20th century. How about this one? I'm going to read this one to you because some of you may recognize from where I've taken this, others may not. These are particular recommendations of a very famous theologian about how we are to deal with the Jews. And I'll read it to you because I know way back there it's a long, a long distance. And you know, soccer coaches sometimes have trouble seeing things from a long, long distance. So first, set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming of his son and of his Christians. Second, I advise that their houses also be ravaged and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings, the Talmud is a set of 13 volumes of rabbinic commentary on Torah, on the first five books of what we Christians call the Old Testament, in which idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are, are taught not be taken from. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of life, of loss of life and limb. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for Jews. Sixth, I advise that usury, that is, lending money to get interest, right? Be prohibited to them, and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them. Seventh, I recommend that Jews be forced to do hard manual labor. In 1543, the founder of Protestantism the one who is the architect and the chief proponent of the Protestant Reformation had those things to say. I simply lifted that out of one of his books that is called Against the Jews and Their Lives. Now, in fairness to Luther, I gotta say, he really thought that the Protestant Reformation would reform the church and remember, the church at that time was the Roman Catholic Church, right? And Luther was indeed a monk, and he was trying to reform the church from inside the church, but it was the Catholic Church. There was no Protestant church as of yet. But he believed with these improvements, these repairs, this purifying of the Catholic Church, all the obstacles to Jews converting to Christianity would be removed. His belief was Jews don't become Christians because of the abuses present in the Catholic Church. Well, Protestantism emerges as its own particular denomination, right? Today we have three basic branches of Christianity, Roman Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox. When Protestantism became what it became, the Jews still didn't convert, and he got mad. He got angry. So this is a, an angry Martin Luther. So to be fair to him, it, it, I don't appreciate what he had to say. I don't condone. I don't agree with what he had to say. But he was getting very, very frustrated that Jews seemed so unwilling to convert to Christianity, which to him was clearly the true religion. Now, this is too complicated to go through. I didn't compile this. Raoul Hilbert, whom I mentioned to you before, who said Hitler didn't suddenly invent anti-Semitism, and he simply tapped it. What Hilbert did, that's so telling here, so telling, 
he went through and he compared proclamations of the Christian church through the centuries, going all the way back to early centuries until later centuries, and he compared that to the laws that Nazis passed. And what he did, he put them side by side where the laws were the same. <coughs> I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Jews and Christians cannot socialize. That was a particular proclamation of the church. In 1935, it became a law under Adolf Hitler and the Nuremberg race laws. So if you want to learn more about this, I won't take time to go through all of these. That would, say, that would take too long. And I value the opportunity for us to have conversation and you to ask questions, etc. because that's a lot of fun for me. But I'll just simply refer you to Raoul Hilberg, H-I-L-B-E-R-G, and his arrangement of these two particular considerations. The proclamations of the Christian church at its councils, and on the right-hand side, the laws of Nazi Germany. Well, for that matter, just so that you see maybe the impact of that, when Hitler got the Nuremberg race laws passed in 1935, he got some international criticism. And you know how he responded to defend his choices? He said, I borrowed some of this from the Jim Crow laws of the United States of America. So please understand, I'm not, in terms of my own nationality and my own culture, being self-righteous here, because we have some, some things to think about and perhaps for which to repent as well. Remember what I just said. Hitler said he got the impetus for some of his ideas from the Jim Crow laws of the United States of America. Well, again, I've already said this to you, that Hitler incorrectly regarded Jews as members of a race, and it was a separate race. It wasn't uh, Caucasian, it wasn't Negroid, and it wasn't Mongoloid, and that was different from the Aryan race. And he had, well, this is embarrassing. Some of this is embarrassing to me as a theologian, but those of you who know me know that I'm also a scientist um, and have terminal degrees in both of these fields. And it's embarrassing to me as a scientist that science gets used here. Hitler thought he had scientific evidence that indicated that Jews were inferior. Much the way that science was used at certain stages in the United States of America to demonstrate that African Americans are inferior. The misuse of science. So there's Nazi propaganda that comes out about the Jews. You see these kinds of images, and here you see a Jewish person sitting on uh, a large bag of pelt or money indicating that not Jews are all about money. They're, they're, they're money grubbing vermin. Get my words. They're money grubbing vermin. What's vermin? Lice. What do you do with lice? You get rid of them. This is a famous book, and I mentioned it in our first session last Sunday, just in passing. And that is, ever since this was published in 1905, actually in Russia, it's a book that indicates that the Jews have a plan to take over the world. And the French edition, 1934, it just simply says the Jewish peril. The peril of the there, in terms of the French. So Hitler, also in Mein Kampf, his book that was written when he was in prison for nine months, you may recall, he was sentenced to five years for his attempt to take over the German government in 1923. Convicted, sent to jail, spoke for five years, you know, to serve nine months. And while he was in the jail for nine months, he dictated to some fellow prisoners and also some guards what's known as my struggle, that is, my Kampf. And in that particular book, he echoes this kind, of, well, actually, in the French edition, he precedes it but in terms of the 1905 uh, Russian edition, which started this particular piece, he echoes that Jews somehow want to take over the world, and, and we've got to stop. There's a worldwide conspiracy to take over the world, and the Jews are behind it. Now, before you think that that's something that those rascal Russians 
or those fanatic French did, Henry Ford subscribed to that notion. Yes, Henry Ford of the Model T. Yes, Henry Ford of Michigan. And he had this particular thing translated into English, and it's simply called the International Jew. And it's a pretty good, good in the sense of accurate linguistically, not good in terms of morality. It's a good translation of the original protocol of the elders of Zion. The elder, elders of Zion would be Jewish leaders, and the protocol was their worldwide conspiracy, their plan to take over the planet. Jews were then seen as uh, very sly bargainers, a sleazy businessman, not the kind of person you can trust. You know, I recently had my driveway paved, and I was so struck I had some folks uh, from Abbeville come to do that. And the guy's name is Ron Holt. I'm not, this is not a commercial message. It's just indicating. And I said to him, well, how much will that cost? And I thought, well, okay, it'll cost, I better go sell a kidney. Uh, but it will cost X amount of money. And, and I said, where do I sign? And he said, we don't sign. You just shake my hand. <laughs> That doesn't work in New Jersey, where I'm from, right? Anyway, my, my, my point is simply, you can never trust Jews in terms of business, right? You can never a handshake, a gentleman's agreement. I mean, Jews are sleazy, they're conniving, you can't trust them. I mentioned Mein Kampf, and I need to support with evidence what I said, that he has in there business about the Jews want to take over the world. He also has in there this particular quote that to me is very scary, but it does point to his attitude, his perspective. And that is, he said, the personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape. Can you see what follows is a logical progression, or I might say not regression, from that particular attitude. If Jews are demonic, and if they're the cause of our problems, then we're better off without them. And anything we need to do to get rid of them would be justified. If, if, if you have some form of cancer, and getting rid of that cancer by some kind of surgery would be really something warranted, wouldn't it? But Jews are the cancer on German society. And ultimately they want to be the cancer on the whole world. We've got to get rid of them. And as quickly as possible and by any means that are possible. So more publicity. And then this comes really through the leadership of Josef Goebbels, who was the director of propaganda for Adolf Hitler. He was unfortunately very good at this. And so he had particular uh, cartoons and posters and images out there. And here you have a Jewish guy trying to offer a couple of little children some candy. And his intention is not to be kind and compassionate. What's he going to do with those children? And look what a morally corrupt person a Jew is. Oh goodness, what morally corrupt persons all Jews are. A film came out in 1940. It was called The Eternal Jew. And this is where we get back to my image about rats, right? In this particular film, it has as its theme, Jews, first off, are inferior. They're members of an inferior race. Secondly, they're parasites. They're just leeches on the German society. And they're also responsible for Germany's defeat in World War I. 
They're the ones who punctured national pride and caused the German people no longer to support the war effort. So killing them like rats is not a crime. It's a necessity. Which society would not wish to be free of rats? My observation would be, if you begin to denigrate people, and you begin to portray them as being subhuman, the German word is intervention, then you can be prepared to do very bad things. See my point? I'll give you a, a, a silly example. Okay. If a palmetto bug comes across this floor, and I, yeah, you're already, you're already in the room with large you? And I go, which one of you is going to go complaining to Kyle Hyde and say, well, Cliff Kane, on the premises of First Press Greenwood, killed a palmetto bug? Which one of you? No, well, I know you might, but nobody else in this room would do that. Okay, now, a kitten starts to walk across this floor, and I grab it and I strangle it. Kyle, you're going to be besieged by a lot of calls protesting that particular action. Why? Because the kitten is higher in the chain of being to human beings. So what if I cost you and start hitting you on the head? Oh my goodness, I'm going to be in real trouble. The session's going to have an immediate meeting about that. Security's going to come running in. You see where I'm going? So as you portray people and image them as less than human, you can be greatly, more greatly prepared to do nasty, bad things. Make sense? So if you can portray Jews as rats or palmetto bugs, right, as lice, then I think you're put in a position to be able to say, what we're doing is not only justified, it's necessary. So, this is my conclusion, and then we can talk about it. I tried to leave 15 or 20 minutes for discussion. My big point is anti-Semitism has been around for a long time, and it had been around for a long time before Adolf Hitler took power. The Nazis didn't create this hatred, they tapped what already existed, and then they used it for their purposes. Their propaganda machine, this is the guy I mentioned to you, directed by Joseph Goebbels, was successful in feeding on the public's fear, the need to find a scapegoat, jealousy of successful Jews. Let me put a parenthesis in there. In the Jewish tradition, study is an act of worship. I only wish my college students could have understand, understood that. Study is an act of worship. So if you get a certain education, if you, if you go to high school and, and you're Jewish, that's a way of praising God. If you get further degrees, that's a way of praising God. You see where I'm going with this? So education has always been important to the Jewish tradition. It's an act of worship. In, in fact, the word synagogue, which is not a Jewish word, it's actually a Babylonian word, it's ugritic. No, not a great, not a great. Um, what's the language? What's the language from Babylon? Uh, I can't remember. Akkadian or whatever, whatever, whatever. It's not important. It's not a Jewish word, right? It's another tradition's word. The Jews brought it back with them after the Babylonian exile in the sixth century BC. And it means what? Does it mean place of worship? Church? Place of study. Place of study. So study, learning, degrees, that's a part of Jewish tradition. Well, what came along with that? Jews would do that also because it gave them positions in society that seemed to be necessary for the society, right? Essential, valued, like, 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 like big doctors. But right? so you really are valued. You really, you really are. But being attorneys, right? Being, being businessmen, right? These are things that are valued, and they all took high levels of education. So Jews believed that that would help keep them a little more secure, a, a little more safe. But, but, but it also produced envy. 
And people said, well, those Jews, those, are, those attorneys, they're, they're bringing in a lot of money. And do you know what it costs for a, a visit to the doctor these days? <laughs> you see where I'm going with that. So there tended to be envy at the same time that Jews were doing these things as an act of worship and as a way of trying to put themselves in indispensable positions in the society, right, where they might be safe, valued, right? but they were envy and jealousy set in. And traditional religious animosity of Christians toward Jews. And, and you can decide how much of that animosity is anti-Judaism and how much of that is anti-Semitism. That's not for me to tell you what to think. I've already told you what my perspective is. So, by picturing Jews using stereotypes and racist sentiments and drawing on prejudice, the Germans were able to justify discrimination, taking away people's rights, and finally murder. Because you see, a pure and clean German society needed to be rid of rats. Anti-Semitism, the longest hatred. We have some time, and I'm glad we do. And I'm sorry about those comments I made about physicians. Don't come after me. Yes, you have a question. Just for your next exams, don't be fucked up. How did Hitler handle um, mixed marriages and bloodlines and you know, things like that? Okay. The, the question from the good doctor who's going to charge me four times the normal rate for a, 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 a visit. <laughs> has said, what, what, did, what did Hitler do? <laughs> Just the image of, never mind. <laughs> you know, the, the conversation was kind of here, Doc, and then it, 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 it kind of, hey, you know, I, I brought it on myself. I deserve it. I, I, I'm a rat that deserves to be cast out of this assembly. His question was, how did Hitler deal with people who were of mixed blood? Let's, let's say you had a, a Jewish person marry uh, a goy, that is a, a Gentile, a non-Jew. How did Hitler deal with that? Not well. Because first of all, there were laws against that. There were laws against socializing with Jews, dating Jews, marrying Jews, having children with Jews. And he believed that the taint of being Jewish even though you'd be half Jewish and half Goy, half Gentile, that that remained with the offspring. In fact, he even believed that Jews who converted to Christianity still were bad blood, and there's no way that they could be exempt from persecution. So Jews were not even sick. Remember last week on Sunday, on Sunday morning, I said, Three ways of dealing with Jews was, first of all, to try to forcibly convert them. Secondly, it was to exile them, deport them, get them out of here. And the third was kill them. The conversion for Hitler was not even something he viewed as legitimate. Because a converted Jew was still a Jew. And remember, the biological definition of a Jew is having a Jewish mother. But today in 2023, it means having one Jewish parent. You don't have to have both parents Jewish for a person to be Jewish, right? So he didn't even think that persons who were Jews who converted to Christianity were, were, were somehow safe and, and okay. Uh, actually, you had a question. I saw your hand go. Yeah, um, so it's well documented that anti-Semitism is rising Yes, sir. What do you think, how should the Christian church respond to the rising tide of anti-Semitism? Okay, you all heard the question. He said, anti-Semitism is on the rise, and it is, worldwide, but also in the United States. Um, over 7,000 instances in the United States of America in 2021, as reported by the Anti-Defamation League, that is the ADL. 
They have not yet compiled the statistics for 2022, but the forecast is it's going to be a record year and probably will exceed 2021. So the question becomes, what does the Christian church do? How do we respond? And I'll certainly say more about that in the lecture on the sacred turf of your university, Lander, when I give a talk later this month. But it seems for now I can say, first off, and on a very elementary basis, we have to be able to affirm that Jesus was Jewish. There were theologians in Nazi Germany who were lured by pressure and by the enticement of money to try to figure out a way to make Jesus Aryan, to make Jesus non-Jewish. Because you see, if you want to enlist Christians acting in these bad kinds of ways, you've got to somehow de Jesus even a verb? Kyle, is this a verb? De Judaize Jesus? You, you've got to remove Jesus from being Jewish, right? And so when I was growing up and we had those pictures of portrayals of Jesus in the Fellowship Hall, and he looked more like, if I can use this reference, Bjorn Borg, the famous Swedish tennis player, if that, that's familiar to some of you. Jesus had uh, blonde hair, he had blue eyes, he had light skin, and no, he didn't. We've been misled. Uh, Oscar, if I could pick on you for a second, Jesus looked more like you than me, right? Dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes, right? So I think one thing we can do is affirm the Jewishness of Jesus. Right? I think the second thing we can do is we can affirm that Jews still remain a covenant people. It's not the new covenant, that's our Christian perspective now, but God still worked really pretty wonderful things through the Jewish people. I mean, we have the scriptural texts through the Jewish people that Jesus knew. Jesus never memorized John 3.16, for God so loved the world no! The New Testament was not yet formed. What were Jesus' sacred scriptures? The Jewish scriptures. So they've given us that. Judaism has also given us monotheism. Judaism also gave us the Ten Commandments. As I said to the group today at noon, Jews actually have an eleventh commandment. Well, actually, in terms of all the commandments Jews have, they have 613, just not the ten. But if we could use the 10 for a second, there's an 11th commandment in Judaism. Thou shalt survive. Thou shalt survive. In the face of all, thou shalt survive. So we got the 10 commandments from, from Jews. I think a couple other things we need to do actually is we need to engage in some very careful exegesis of biblical passages that seem to portray Jews in negative ways. And I listed some of those up there for you, but there's one passage in particular in the New Testament that says, uh, I'll paraphrase it, Jesus' blood is on us and on all our ancestors. What do you do with that? Or on Good Friday services, when people are upset because Jesus did indeed die on the cross. He died a horrible death, and, and we say he died for you and me, and our salvation comes as a result of that particular event. But that wasn't an easy day for Jesus. And Jesus genuinely suffered. He didn't appear to suffer. No Gnosticism and no asceticism here, actually. But he suffered for you and me, and it was, it was real. We've got to deal with our, our Holy Week Rituals, which, which basically portray the Jews in negative ways. And the other thing we have to do is we have to protest at any time a film. I saw it several times. It's powerful. I think if they hit Jesus one more time with that cat of nine tails, I was going to throw up, right? So the suffering of Jesus and the sacrifice clearly depicted in Mel Gibson's film. But all of the passages that are used in that particular film are taken from the Gospel of John. 
And the Gospel of John was recorded at about 100 AD, and that's the time when Jews and Christians were fighting with each other to get converts. And so John has some negative things to say about Jews. And if you notice that film, the depictions of Jews, they're in shadows, their noses are crooked, they're dressed in black. It really portrays Jews as being demonic. We've got to protest those things, actually. We can't let those things go. Because this is my bottom line. Sorry to be on the soapbox here, but I feel very strongly about this. And I want to have other questions as well. If you hate Jews, then you hate my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It comes down to that. If you hate Jews, you hate Jesus of Nazareth, who is my and your Lord and Savior. That's what the Christian church has to do, in my opinion. Open a postscript, I can't stop, I can't stop, is... When other people are treated that way, we have to protest that as well. What is, it, uh, what is a Jew? I mean, what entitles you to be a Jew? Is it you have to come from Abraham, any of your mother, down the line? I mean, all kinds of varieties of Jews. So, how do you, what do you okay. think? What a great question. Thank you for asking it. Your check is in the mail. I appreciate that. He asked, uh, How do you become a Jew? Well, first off, it's a biological definition. It's a biological definition. You're Jewish, traditionally, if you're born of a Jewish mother. So the example I like to use is the head librarian at my university in Indiana, Ron Schutz, a very devout and faithful Roman Catholic. He married Lynn, who's Jewish. They have three kids. One of those kids was my daughter's high school soccer coach. All three of those kids are Jewish because their mother, Lynn, is Jewish, even though Ron is Roman Catholic. So that's the first definition. So it's a biological definition. You can become a practitioner of the Jewish religion. Well, I mean, you don't have to be a practitioner of the Jewish religion to be a Jew. Got that? In other words, it's a biological definition. You're Jewish by the circumstances of your birth. You don't have to be a practitioner of Judaism, the religion of the Jewish people, in order to be a Jew. At that point, you're not a faithful Jew in terms of religion, but, 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 but you're still Jewish. Does that make some sense? In modern times, either parent can be Jewish, and the offspring are Jewish from the Jewish perspective. Now, let's assume I want to convert to being Jewish. Well... I go to the rabbi and I say, I want to become Jewish. And he looks at me askance and says, go away and come back later. I go a second time to the rabbi and I say, I want to become Jewish. I want to be a practitioner of the religion of the Jewish people, which is Judaism. And he says, go away and come back later. The third time I go, he says, okay, it's time for you to study the Torah. And at the conclusion of years of study, I can then become a Jew. And they view me biologically to be a Jew, as well as to be a practitioner of the religion of the Jewish people, which is Judaism. Isn't that interesting? So in Israel today, when you travel around, one of the complaints the rabbis have is, they got all these Jews, and not a whole bunch of them are faithful. Because they don't go to synagogue. They don't go, right? But they're still Jewish because of the biology and the rabbis complain. <laughs> we have all these Jews and they're not religious. Can you imagine? And so you get that when you travel around uh, the Holy Land. That's a great question. An influence uh, on the please. process of ethnic cleansing oh. in relation with his moral standards. Great question. You're obviously a sophomore at Lander University. That, that, did you hear the question? He said, how did the notion of evolution or sometimes what's called uh, social Darwinism. How did that impact Hitler's attempt to ethnically cleanse German society? Wonderful question. There, there are several books that Nazis put out, and it talked about the way in which, in nature, the weak tend to be dinner 
for the powerful. Now, some of you know that I worked as a part of my degree in environmental science with the cheetahs of South Africa. And you know, when a cheetah goes after a Thompson gazelle, they are successful about 50% of the time. And it's not good for the Thompson gazelle. It, it doesn't turn out well. Right? Cheetahs will go after the slower Thompson gazelles. They go after gazelles that are sick. Some of them have injury. And so I can't even begin to think of how many Thompson gazelles have been sacrificed on the savannas of Africa by cheetahs that can go to 70 miles an hour in three seconds. And that, that's almost as fast as, as I can run. <laughs> the, my point is this, the weak get weeded out. The Jews are weak. The Jews are crippled religiously, culturally, so social Darwinism that taught that the strong survive, the survival of the fittest. He basically said, yeah, that's the way it goes. And then he said, some of these ideas I really got from Great Britain and the United States. Because in the late 19th century, early 20th century, what did we have? The eugenics movement that basically said, we're going to weed out undesirable characteristics in people. And one of my heroes was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Oliver Holmes, and he made a decision, he wrote the majority position, there was a woman who was mentally deficient, and she had children, and they wanted to sterilize her. And the case went to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of my favorites, he said simply, no more imbeciles. And he ruled that the woman would be sterilized. Because we, we can't have any more imbeciles. You see, we, we, in terms of breeding of cattle and breeding of pigs and breeding of things, we always breed for desirable traits, don't we? And we want to improve the species. Well, we have these things that hold us back. They drag us down. They're called Jews. So we tried to appropriate science in a way to be able to justify some of his programs. So one of the programs he did, and then I will be quiet and ask maybe one more question. He had a program called T4. The T4 program was at Tiergartenstrasse in Berlin. And he took their children who had particular physical and mental handicaps and he killed them. He killed them. With a key physician doctor.